the IOE. And it's my honor to introduce Joseph Sharp, who is also in the IOE. He's a Montana State professor in, in electrical and computer engineering. And he's also the director of the Optical Technology Center here. So Joe came to MSU in 2001 following a master's degree at University of Utah and a PhD in optical sciences at the University of Arizona. And then I think about 10 years of work as part of in um, NOAA's, what is it, the Environmental Technology Lab, where he was also working with the optical remote sensing applications and technology. So his accomplishments are many. He has, I think, recently received a PK, so the Presidential Early Career Award. Oh, a while ago. Oh, a while ago, okay. And um, is a fellow for the Optical Society of America. And his research explores very broad and diverse uses of optical sensors for exploring Earth's natural environment, everything from sky polarization to um, use of LIDAR uh, to look at water vapor in clouds to the use of LIDAR to explore fish habitat, which he's going to talk about today. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you, and thank you, all you that are out there in TV land. Glad to have you with us. I'm glad to see somebody here. You know, I was getting all these emails from people saying, I'd love to be there, but I'm in whatever, you know, name your country, <laughs> um, whatever experiment. And so I was afraid that maybe I'd have an empty room and a camera, but it's good to see you here. Well, it's, it's spring break, isn't it? Almost spring break, yeah. So we, uh, I won't be here next week. I would like to acknowledge right at the start the people, other people involved in the project that I'm going to be talking about. There's actually a lot of pieces and parts that fit into this, but, uh, but the specific development of the LIDAR has been heavily facilitated by Nathan Pust. Oh, I'm going to try to remember not to use the laser here so that you people on the camera can see what I'm pointing at. And Mike Rodewig, who is a PhD student with me right now. Um, I'm also working on this project, the, the small piece of the project with uh, trying to fly this LIDAR with Rick Hauer up at Flathead Lake Biological Station. And so Rick, if you're out there, hello. Glad to, glad to have you with us. And what we're trying to do, in, in essence, is to develop a small LIDAR system. So LIDAR is an acronym, just like RADAR is, except for RADAR is such a popular acronym, so widely used that people don't even think of it as an acronym anymore. They just know it is radar. It's just a, a word. But radar actually means radio detection and ranging. And LIDAR stands for light detection and ranging. Some people will call it LADAR, which is laser detection and ranging, same thing. Um, generally speaking, LIDAR tends to deal with distributed scattering, so scattering from particles in the sky or particles in the ocean or lakes. And LADAR tends to deal with hard target scattering. So shining a laser on the side of a helicopter to determine where it is or something like that. But those distinctions are loose. Our goal for the particular project that I'll try to focus on today, the, the talk will wander wide and far, but there hopefully will be a focus that we'll come back to. And that is this idea that I've had for a long time to try to bring to MSU some of the technology that I helped start and play with when I was working at NOAA. And that is airborne LIDAR specifically for the purposes of looking into water, and in this case, probably mostly lake water, although we can certainly consider rivers and streams. And I'll have more to say about the differences later, but this is very different from the kind of LIDAR that you might use if you're working with topographic LIDAR, for example, to do terrain mapping. There are some very important differences between this system and those. And the primary difference is that it's designed optimally to, to penetrate water, and those are not. We are driven by an interest in being able to map out invasive lake trout, for example, in Yellowstone Lake, plankton layers and water properties and, and applications that relate to those. So I'm going to go back to part of what you introduced in your introduction to me, which is where I used to work, because this is where this all started. I worked for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration for 12 years in Boulder, Colorado. Um, that was my office right there. And we actually, we were in an old, not so nice looking building for most of the time I was there. And then 
we built a new building and then I decided to leave. Bad timing. But, um, at, at NOAA, at this lab, we did a lot of different kind of work with different technologies for remote sensing. And so I was being asked ahead of time, you know, did, did the lab focus on optical remote sensing? And the answer is no. We had everything from acoustics to electromagnetic of all wavelengths. Optical was just a, a piece of the pie. And while I was at NOAA, I got involved in research literally from one end of the globe to the other with all kinds of primarily optical and infrared remote sensing systems. So we literally worked from the Arctic to the tropics, which will be the next slide. I'll say a few words about this, though, just because it relates to something that's going on now. These are fairly old pictures, but um, this is actually me up in Barrow, Alaska with my original version of what I call the infrared cloud imager. This is an instrument that sits on the ground and looks up and measures clouds. And dri we're driven there by primarily the scientific interest in, in measuring Arctic clouds and characterizing their optical properties as a function of space and time. Turns out satellites have, have a very difficult time doing that because you look down and there's no thermal contrast between the ground and the cloud, or not no, but very little thermal contrast and very little visible contrast. So it doesn't matter what wavelength you're at, the satellites struggle to see Arctic clouds. And so we're working there. And, and actually, right as I speak, I have an instrument that is a newer, updated version of that instrument operating at that same site. And it's been there for about a year and a half now. And so that's been exciting to see that instrument mature. And now we're, we're operating it long term in, in Alaska. And so we conducted research in the Arctic and then literally went to the other side of the world and, and got involved with uh, South Pacific tropical research. This is a picture of one of the NOAA ships that we were running some instruments on sitting in Pongo Pongo Harbor in Amer American Samoa. Really a dramatic place, very hot place. And this is just kind of a tourist picture, but I put it in because of two reasons. One is I was better looking back then, but you can't see the details. You know, I'm just sort of a, a blob there. But trust me, I was better looking back then. And the guy sitting next to me on this pillbox, this old World War II pillbox, is Jim Chernside, who was my boss at NOAA. And really, I think of him more as a colleague than a boss. We, we just have done all kinds of things. We've been working together for multiple decades. And um, I'll show his picture more. In, in the coming slides, and I'll have him in the acknowledgments at the end. Jim has been a big, a big influence on a lot of things that I do, but he really is the one that has pioneered this uh, fish and lake, not so much lake, but fish and marine LIDAR technology. He's the one that gets the credit for that. I'm just sort of following behind and picking up the ideas. Um, along the way, we began to work more and more doing ocean measurements. And so a couple pictures here just showing this is probably not that same NOAA ship. This is a different NOAA ship that we met. This is in Darwin, Australia. And this instrument out on this boom is an instrument that I designed and built. And it's looking down at the ocean and scanning around, looking at the ocean and the sky and measuring air-sea temperature differences as we cruised through the warm pool and looked at the El Nino kind of effects. And then this instrument here hanging on this boom is a scanning laser instrument that is measuring the statistics of small scale roughness on the ocean surface. And we made some fairly significant contributions in that area. And this, this is an interesting ship, quote unquote. I don't know if any of you know what it is. Has anybody ever seen this? It's called FLIP. It's called the Floating Instrument Platform. It's actually formerly a Navy ship. And it looks like a baseball bat. It's a long tube with a head of a ship on the end of one end of the tube. And what they do is it's, it's unpowered. It floats out there. It's just towed out by a tugboat on the site, wherever you're going to take your measurements, in this case off the coast of Oregon. And then they pump the air out and pump water into the tube. And so the, the tube is like this, and it, it tips slowly vertically. And so all the living quarter in here, all the living quarters are on trunnions. They loosen everything up and all the beds, the, the entire galley, 
the workstations, everything rotates 90 degrees, and what was the wall becomes the floor and vice versa. And then you just bob. You, you literally go on an ocean bob for however many weeks. And so I lived on there for multiple weeks doing this experiment with this instrument. And it's moving, it was laying down like this? Yeah, yeah, it, it lays horizontal and it's towed. And then once it's towed, they release it. And they pump water, you know, they flood the lower compartments so that it flips vertically. And those towers on it had to rotate too. When it was Everything there. does, yeah. And the interesting thing is, is that the reason it was developed originally was for doing the acoustic measurements of the ocean. And they needed a very stable ocean platform. So this is unlike any ship you've ever been on because it, it bobs with the long waves and takes out all that, takes out or just compensates for that motion, I guess. And so it's very, it's very strange. After I lived on there for a couple of weeks, I came off and I remember I, I got onto the ground and I just felt like I couldn't walk. And I, I laid down in bed and I couldn't go to sleep because I had been rocked to sleep for three weeks or whatever. <laughs> You just get used to this gentle rocking motion all the time, and it just felt too weird. And so it was too still and too quiet. <laughs> anyway, so we made some ocean measurements. And then Jim, here's Jim Trueside, the guy that I just mentioned. Jim, as I started veering off in one direction and doing kind of polarization measurements, Jim started really focusing heavily on the airborne LIDAR work. And so this is a picture of him in one of the airplanes driving the LIDAR system. And then I got involved with that a little bit right before I left, and then I've, I've collaborated with him ever since. So the NOAA LIDAR that was developed originally for doing fish mapping was designed to fly in fairly, you know, kind of medium to large size airplanes, such as this NOAA Twin Otter. Typically, dual engine airplanes, you're, you're usually flying out over the open ocean, so you need a little bit more power stability. This is a picture of the early NOAA fish LIDAR in that airplane, and I show this primarily to give you an idea of where we started in terms of size. And so this is an electronics rack. So this is sitting in the airplane. This travels with the LIDAR. I mean, this is the electronics part of the LIDAR. And so that electronics rack, if it were sitting in front of me, would be about this tall. So, you know, four feet tall or something like that about this wide. So it's fairly large and heavy, certainly much larger and heavier than you could ever hope to put in something like a Cessna. You just can't do that. And then this is the optics package. And it's, this is the telescope. Uh, I can't really point out details because it's hard to see here, but there's a laser here that's pointing down. Then the telescope is looking down to collect backscattered light. So the, the basic principle of LIDAR is that just like with radar, a radar will send out a radio pulse, and then wait for it to come back. And from the time of flight, knowing the speed of light, you can determine the distance to the object. And then from parameters like the intensity of the backscattered radiation, the polarization state of the backscattered radiation, you can start determining other things beyond simply where is the object. And then if you think about this in terms of distributed scattering, like a beam going through the atmosphere, and you're, you're getting constant scattering from the particles in the atmosphere. If you pass through a dense cloud of, well, just let's say a cloud, can't be too dense or else we won't pass through it in the optical regime, but let's say you pass through a thin cloud, then you get more scattering inside the cloud than you do outside of the cloud. So your data will, and I'll show you data traces later, will show a peak so you can see that there's more scattering there. And if you calibrate, then you can quantitatively determine some parameter of the cloud from that measurement. But you also see scattering from the molecular scattering and the, and the aerosol scattering of the particles in the air. And then when, once this beam looking down, once this punches into the water, you also get scattering from the particles in, in the water, including any plankton or fish or anything like that that's there to do the scattering. And so because of that, this LIDAR system, we typically operate Tilted backward, you can see here that that's not just an optical illusion. It's tilted at about 15 or 20 degrees off of zenith, or off of nadir. Actually, it's pointing at nadir. So it's nadir off by about 15 degrees. And the reason is, is that if you look straight down, you get such a bright reflection from the water surface that you just saturate your detector, and then it rings and gives you all kinds of weird artifacts. 
So we look down at this angle so that the specular or mirror-like reflection of the beam goes off over there somewhere, and all we see is the scattering. You still see a really bright signal at the surface, but you, you don't kill yourself the way you do if you point straight down. And so actually what you want is you want this light arc to have a variable angle because if you're flying over really if you're flying over really smooth water, you can go almost to nadir. But if you're flying over wind rough roughened water, then the probability of having a slope that reflects back to you increases, and so you have to increase the angle to get out of that regime where you're getting such a bright specular reflection. And you have a window on the bottom of the plane that that's looking. Yeah, so that's that's the critical thing is that whatever airplane you're flying in has to have a big hole in the floor, and it's in this particular case the floor the hole had to be about this big, and so that's hard to find. We operate with a smaller hole now, but back in those days we were looking for a fairly large hole. Um, in the early 2000s, several years after I came here to to Bozeman, I uh, partnered with Jim and his group at NOAA, and we brought their fish LIDAR up here to fly over Yellowstone Lake and try to see if we could see invasive lake trout with such a device. I was literally giving a talk kind of like this, actually, shortly after I came to the university, and I was sort of introducing myself, saying, here is a bunch of stuff I've been involved with, and talking about the different research that I thought I would do while I was here. And I talked a little bit about the fish LIDAR, and I just said, well, you know, we don't have an ocean here, and so obviously I'm not going to do that anymore. And somebody came up to me after the talk and said, actually, you might want to think about it because have you heard about the, the lake trout problem? And I said, no, I haven't. So they ex explained that to me. And so we'll talk more about that in a minute. This particular plane that we got to come to Bozeman and fly over the lake was a King Air. And it actually flew here from Virginia. And so I spent the, the majority of my budget flying the airplane here and back. And, you know, a third of my budget was for airplane time over the lake or whatever. And the, the downside is that, again, exactly what you were talking to me about, that we needed this big hole in the floor. And we knew a handful of airplanes that had the proper configuration that we could fly. And there were some that I found in the Rockies, but, but during the spawning season, which is about September, all those airplanes anywhere close to the Rockies are all completely tied up on fire contract. Mm -hmm. and. It was raining and snowing. You can see the snow on the bridges here. And it, there were no fires, but those planes were all under contract, so they were sitting there on the runway comfortably getting paid while I wished I had an airplane. So I had to go to this company that we had leased airplanes from in the past and leased their airplane, and they came all the way over. And, and so, like I said, it costs a lot of money to lease an airplane, especially when you have to bring one in from far away. And that really is where we... I'm going to deviate from the talk for just a moment and just make a comment. That's really where we started having this idea that if this is going to be a useful tool for us here in this kind of application, we really need a, a more compact LiDAR system that can operate in a small Cessna or something so that we can, you know, airplanes of opportunity type of idea. Just go get Billy Bob and his Cessna out of Gallatin Field, pop your LiDAR in there and fly. That's what we wanted to do. But we were a long way away from that back in these days. For one thing, it needs basically 1,500 watts to run the thing. And again, inside the airplane is, you know, a package that's nice, but it's fairly large, especially for what you would be able to fit into a Cessna. And then I think you all know Yellowstone Lake. We are, where are we? <laughs> Up there, and there's the Yellowstone Lake. And the... The mean depth is 42 meters. The maximum depth is 118 meters. The LIDAR can't see anywhere near that deep. The, the LIDAR beam will be attenuated as it propagates into the water. And it will be attenuated very rapidly, especially in lake water. Open ocean water is quite clear. And we can see down to 40, 50 meters in really clear ocean water. But we can probably only penetrate to about 20 or 25 meters in lake water, depending on the clarity of the water. Okay, so I think some of you are probably much more experts on this problem than I am. But just a quick summary of some of the things as I sort of know them is that in about 1994, invasive lake trout were discovered in Yellowstone Lake. And some recent research that I've read 
attributes the source possibly being um, Lewis Lake, where some of these smaller lakes around Yellowstone Lake were known to already have lake trout. And I guess the idea here is that some of this water was picked up during airlifts to fight the late 80s, what was that, 1988 fires, and you know, pick them up, lake trout and all, and the lake trout, some of them managed to make it into the lake. I don't know. Maybe some of you have a better idea than that. But that's one that I've read that I thought was seem, seeming plausible. But the, the important point for this discussion is that there are lake trout in the lake, and there weren't, they weren't there before, and they don't, we don't want them to be there. And so the idea was, can we use a LIDAR to help find where they're hanging out? And so here's a layout of the NOAA fish LIDAR, and ours is similar to this. So I'll spend a few minutes on it. Um, I put this bullet in just to remind myself to say a few words about this. This is another way in which this LIDAR is very different from what you might use if you're, if you're using point cloud data of to topographic you know, maps and that kind of thing. Those LIDARs have a laser that pulses very, very rapidly, thousands of times per second so that you can scan the beam very rapidly back and forth. And then as you fly forward, you build up literally a three-dimensional map of, of scattering. Those LIDARs can get away with a lot of things that we can't get away with because they're looking at hard targets. and Anybody can see a hard target with any LIDAR almost. I mean, it's just compared to this, it's very easy because it's so bright. So you're, you're hitting your, your beam into a solid target and so you're getting a lot of scatter back. So you really don't need to dwell. You don't need to do a lot of tricks to increase your signal to noise ratio. We have a lot weaker scattering signal, so we have to, to play a little bit more careful design games than that. We also don't bother scanning the system, although you could. And there would be some benefits. But, but the downside to it is, is that it's, it's hard to find a laser. In fact, it's essentially impossible to find a laser that can send out rapid pulses that are rapid enough to scan the beam and still have enough pulse energy to penetrate into the water to any significant depth. So if you took your topographic scanning LIDAR and flew over water, you would see into the water, and I've seen some data, but you would only see you know, a couple centimeters or so into the water. You wouldn't see very much. And, so, and also the wavelength of those is typically around um, 1064 nanometers, and that's a wavelength that doesn't penetrate into the water more than a handful of centimeters. As compared to what you're seeing here, something like 20 meters, is that what you said? Yeah, 20 to 30 meters, maybe. And the lake trout habitat, is that in the 20 meter the, I'll like come to that, that, actually. But, but yeah, lake trout live much deeper than what we can see. So the time when we can go looking for them is during spawning season when they come up. Yeah. So we can only do anything for this problem during spawning season. So good question. OK, so what we do is we have a laser. Uh, steering mirrors, these are not scanning mirrors, these are just fixed steering mirrors just used to adjust the beam to align it. And that goes down out of the airplane, hits the water, scatters from the stuff in the water, the backscattered light goes everywhere, and some of the backscattered light makes it back into the telescope, gets focused into some optics and a detector and the computer. And a lot of the technology that is really making a LIDAR complicated is inside that computer. And that has to do with this bullet right here. The NOAA system uses a very special set of electronics that exist in a copy of one only. And so, I mean, we even, when I was there, we even sponsored an SBIR project for a company to make something to replace this, and it didn't work so well. It kind of worked. But what's, what Jim is using is an analog to digital converter, because you get a voltage out of your detector, and you have to sample that electronically, and you have to sample it very, very fast. And the reason you have to sample it very, very fast is because the faster you sample, the better your resolution. And we need to have something better than you know 20 meter resolution, because otherwise we'd have one data point. So he has a giga sample per second sample. So he's sampling a billion, 10 to the 9 times per second. But you know, not too many years ago, the best you could do with a giga sample per second was with 8 bits. So we have a dynamic range problem. That means that there's 2 to the 8, or 256 levels in your data. The problem with that is the LiDAR signal is, has huge dynamic range, multiple orders of magnitude. So that means that you either saturate 
or, or you adjust so you don't saturate and then you don't see the weak signal that you're really looking for. So there's a real big problem. He gets around that problem by using 8 bits but using them through a logarithmic amplifier so that you compress your data. And that's, that works, but it's problematic. The calibration, for example, it, it's, it's a log-ish amplifier. So you know, it gives you a log type of behavior. And so it's hard to calibrate. It's, it's, it's a really nice receiver, but I can't buy one because the only one that we have in the world right now is in his LiDAR. And so we do this, we are taking a different approach. So here's a summary of that problem. With, with dynamic range, the two things we need is we need a fast sample rate and high bit depth. You can't buy that. Or if you can buy it, it costs lots of money. As of this year, now we're starting to be able to buy a solution that's pretty good. Four years ago, we couldn't even do this. But now it's getting there. Now you can go four gigabytes. Four giga samples per second at eight bits. So, if I had a log amp, I could go with that card and have four giga sample per second. That gives me almost that gives me just under four centimeters of range resolution. Remember, if you're used to thinking about centimeter kind of range resolution on a lidar, that's because you're thinking about hard target, which is easy because you just say, "Well, I can see the, the edge." You can assume that the target is hitting the front edge of your pulse. With distributed scattering, it's not that easy. The scattering can be coming from the front or the back or anywhere in between of your laser pulse. So you have a big uncertainty. So the pulse width of the laser pulse limits you to about, in the water, something like you know half a meter or so of resolution. So I need to get something that will resolve that. Um, four giga samples per second sounds good, but I don't want eight bits. 2 giga sample per second is still plenty fast, and 12 bits is getting better. And that's really high resolution still, 7.5 centimeters. This is what we have in our LiDAR system, is this guy. This gives us 800 mega samples per second, so almost a giga sample, with about 18 or 19 centimeter sample resolution. So we have samples about, you know, what is it, about like that. And so that's. We, we can tell you that something is where it is to within sort of that uncertainty. And then if you spend a little bit more money, you can get 16 bits, which is really nice, but only 200 mega samples per second, and that's not fast enough. So the sweet spot for us is right here. When these came out, we bought some of the first ones off the line, and that's been a problem because they're back at the factory right now getting reworked. Okay, this is actually a picture I took while we were flying over the, flying on our way to the Yellowstone Lake. Um, this is kind of a summary of some of the issues why lake trout are a problem. The lake trout eat the native cutthroat trout, and the lake trout live deep and spawn in the lake. Cutthroat trout live shallow and they spawn in the rivers. And so you can't just let it happen and hope that the, that the ecosystem will survive because the lake trout and cutthroat trout are, are not compatible fish. The, the, the bears, otters, pelicans, and osprey, and all the other animals that eat cutthroat cannot get to the lake trout. The only time the lake trout are up in shallower water is during the spawning season. And that's when we go looking for them. So when we flew, this is a map of how we did it. We started over here because we knew there were lots of lake trout in the west thumb. So we went around and around and around and around and actually more like around around this way. And then we came out started doing transects up and down. And these are all regions that, you know, the Park Service folks, who I should acknowledge them too, um, they've been they've been great partners. And uh, Pat Bigelow, for example, has been a big proponent of this technology. And they they had multiple spots down here that they expected to see lake trout, and they just didn't have any more evidence until we came along and gave them some. This is a slower way to fish. <laughs> This is the big advantage of doing airborne LIDAR, is that you can cover the whole lake in an hour or something, and you know the boat would take months to do that. These are some just sort of raw data plots right off of the LIDAR screen, when they, the way they were digitized. And so the top dark line is the water surface, and the bottom line, if you will, is really just the signal decaying away to where it looks like it's aligned. And so this is kind of the top handful of meters where we're seeing most of the scattering. Occasionally you see the bottom underneath the water. P 
peeking in, like right here. There's a little dark spot. And the reason that it's all got this shape is not that the water surface is that shape, it's that the airplane's doing this as it flies. And so we correct that. In fact, we use the surface to correct that. We just say, that's got to be flat, and so we just correct it for that. We also have, you know, electronic instruments to do it, but that, that does such a nice job, we just correct it using the signal right off the, the top of the water. Here's another case where you can see now the bottom terrain becoming more obvious. And you can see that there's a lot more scattering along the top of the surface of the water. And that's because the, um, the wind was blowing. It took us a long time to figure out what that was. But finally, we decided it was just um, surface roughness and, and foam that was being kicked up by the winds. We can also derive extinction coefficients, which has to do with the clarity of the water. And this is a value. There's people that go out on the ship routinely and measure this. And, or on a, not a ship, but a boat, and measure this on the lake. So we can cover the whole thing and do this. Another interesting thing so that we see. Yeah. Could you back up that slide? And yeah. What's the, uh, the uh, color density? What was that referred to? Yeah, these are different values of extinction coefficients. So the red is, is higher extinction, the blue is weaker extinction. Translate that, please. So what that means is that the water clarity is higher for the blue dots and less high for this, which means there's something in the water making it much making it attenuate the optical light much higher here. So there's something scattering or absorbing, most likely scattering in this case. And actually, when we went back and reprocessed this data later, we got rid of a lot of, the, a lot of what you see as structure here. A lot of this was coming about because of this higher scattering layer here. So we decided, oh, well, that's not really what we want. We want more of the bulk water parameters, so we put the the top of the fit down here below that surface and then a lot of that structure went away. But still, if there's structure because of the little, you know, whether it's a plankton bloom or whether it's some biological pro process that I don't even understand that you would know, we can map that out. We can see how this varies. And we can do it sort of, what I'm plotting there is bulk, sort of from the top down to 10 meters depth or something. Or if you're interested in looking just at you know, one to three meters versus three to five meters, we could do that too. And that might be of interest for watching a picnic line go up and down or something. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, another thing that we see that isn't part of the science that we're trying to do, but it just helps explain what you see in the data, is we, we were actually getting snowed on a lot of times when we were flying. This is September, and it was spitting rain and snow at us. And so we were, you can see, there's just a picture I took out the window of the airplane. By the way, this is the way to see the park. At, you know, a couple hundred meters, this is a fabulous way to tour the park. I, I loved it. Here's, we, we turn on the LIDAR some distance above the water, and what we have here is these streaks here that kind of look like verga and rain are exactly that. It's, it's the LIDAR scattering from the rain or snow. And then here's the stuff on the surface. And then here's an underwater shelf that we flew over. This is some terrain under the water. And in fact, I'm going to claim that there are fish. And we don't really have the resolution to see individual fish. That's the other thing we do, is we don't keep our beam small. We actually expand it out so that when we hit the surface, we have about a three, or five, three to five meter diameter <coughs> beam. And the reason you do that is because that way you're not, you're not scanning, so that kind of gives you some spatial sampling of collecting. So we, we can respond to a single fish, <clears throat> but you're actually getting signal that's more like integrated from however many fish are in that spot. And if I zoom into this part of the graph, you can, on this display, uh, on there I can see it better, but on here I can barely see it. There's some features here that we just learned to look for. That and that are just classic signatures of fish hanging out at the edge of these little underwater shelves. And this other stuff is Probably not fish. It could be, but it's probably just the shelf itself. What's the depth there? Um, see if I can remember that. I believe this was at about six meters for this point, and this is down at around 15 or so. What part of the lake was that? This is in the southeast arm. Okay. Near the uh, inlet? Right, right here. Okay. Right. right there. And so what we did is we went through all the data that we collected and just 
made a map of green and red dots. The, the red, actually now I'm forgetting which was which, but one color indicated, we're really sure these are fish. The other was, there's something there, but we don't really know what it is, because we don't have enough information to tell you what is it. But we've learned to do sort of pattern recognition, and we can tell you that certain signatures are almost for sure fish. And so when I showed this to the fisheries biologists, they were most interested in these hits and these hits, because they said those are both places they long suspected were harboring little pockets of fish. So they went down with their boats and dropped a net right close to here and pulled up lake trout with juvenile cutthroat trout in its belly. So there's a kind of ugly graphic description of the problem. Sorry, it's lunchtime. But <laughs> so that's a picture they sent me. That's not my photograph. Um, I got to speed up or else we're not going to get done here. But uh, so we're still going through some history that leads up to our system. Just a few years ago, I flew with Jim in a Cessna Cardinal, which is now we're talking the size that I'm interested in doing. And so this is a picture I took with my fisheye lens looking into the back of the plane. You take the back seats out. So this plane has four seats, a pilot seat, a co-pilot or passenger seat, and then two back seats. Take the two back seats out. <clears throat> There's a hole in this particular airplane because the guy that owns it used to be a physicist at NOAA, and he was also a pilot, and we talked NOAA into letting us put a hole in his airplane, <laughs> and then we hire him as a pilot. And this system is, uh, it has a big electronic, you know, computer system here in the back that's just sitting in the back of the plane. But then the, the pilot, or sorry, the operator of the LIDAR sits in the co-pilot seat with a laptop in his lap. And we actually, the thing that most impressed me is that we, at one point, we sent Jay, the pilot, off on a flight to do about an hour-long series of measurements where we just hit the go button on the, on the laptop strapped the laptop in with the seat belt and said, see you later, Jay. And it, it worked, and we got good data. So it's, the de technology has come a long way. We published a paper about looking at internal waves. This is gravity wave modulation of, in this case, plankton. And so we're sitting between about 15 and 10 meters depth. And so this is, this is the gravity wave inside the water. And in order to see the gravity wave, we're actually looking at scattering objects that are sitting at that level, and that level is being modulated by the gravity wave. Then this is a photograph I took from in the airplane where you can see a surface manifestation of that gravity wave, although it is not a surface wave. And that boat is actually from the University of Rhode Island. They were doing oceanographic sampling so that we knew what we were looking at. And this is not from that measurement, but a similar one in the same place in the San Juans. This is uh, a measurement. Uh, this is a diatom bloom. And so this is an important characteristic of what we're doing these days is we, the LIDAR that we built, for example, and the LIDAR that Jim is flying at this point is a dual polarization LIDAR. So we can detect our signal in two orthogonal polarization states. And one is the same that you sent out, and the other is orthogonal to it. So there's copole, copolarized, and cross-polarized beam. The cross-polarized beam responds only to things that have weird shapes. And so things like diatoms can show up in the cross-polarized beam, which is what I'm showing here. The, the other stuff, like picoplankton, would show up in the co-polarized beam, in the same polarization state that you transmitted with your LIDAR. And the, the analogy that we use all the time in the atmosphere, this is a picture of one of my former graduate students with our LIDAR beam. So this, in this case, this is not a diverged beam like we use on the, on the fish LIDAR. This is a narrow beam that's going up, sampling aerosols and clouds overhead. <clears throat> and in this case, we were measuring this cloud that was creating this corona, and we were trying to determine whether that was liquid water or droplets or ice crystals. And the polarization discrimination allows us to say that that cloud was, without any doubt, ice crystals. And the reason is, is because the when you look at the trace, if it was liquid water, you would see the you would see the cloud in the copolarized beam, and you would not see it in the cross-polarized beam, because spheres have symmetry such that you don't get so spheres or things that are sort of of the size or smaller than the size of the wavelength don't change the polarization of the light, but the 
things with edges like ice crystals and larger shapes like diatoms. They can change the polarization of the light. So from that polarization signature, we can, de we can determine whether we're looking at liquid or ice, or in this case, we can determine whether we're looking at little stuff or, or bigger, oddly shaped things. So then we came along and said, we want to make an even smaller, more compact LIDAR. <clears throat> I'm not going to take you through all the numbers, except for to point out that our goal was to get it down to 500 watts or less so that we could fly in a little Cessna. We designed it originally in this kind of layout so it would sit horizontally because our dream was to put it inside of a cargo pod so that we could literally have the LiDAR in the pod and bolt it on the underside of the plane. And so literally have airplanes of opportunity. Just whoever is around it ready to fly, as long as our cargo pod is compatible with their plane, you just bolt it on and go. <clears throat> this particular airplane belongs to a friend of mine who lives up in Alaska, and he's done a lot of flying for us, and he owns this Cessna with a pod, and so we've dreamed over the years about putting a LiDAR in there. That's a real challenge, because think about how big that LiDAR was that I showed you. That was a picture only 10 years ago. Now we're talking about making it, you know, an order of magnitude smaller. So that scares me, but I'm still interested in doing it, but we haven't done it yet. What we did in the intermediate step because we didn't have enough money to, to ch chase that challenge, is we discovered, hey, Rick has an airplane. And everybody had been telling me this. You need to talk to Rick. And I just somehow assumed that his airplane was the wrong kind of airplane until I talked to him, and it was perfect. It's a little Cessna, and it has a, has a port on the bottom. So this is a picture looking up from the bottom of his airplane at a camera that's looking down through the hole in the floor. And it turns out his hole is just about the right size. It's not this big. But we don't need that big anymore. We need about this big, and that's about what he has. And so this is Rick's plane in Bozeman. He came over here last fall, and we tried to do test flights, and we failed. And the reason we failed was really a couple of things. We had some engineering issues, but we were the engineering issues became issues because his plane, it turns out, didn't have quite the power that he thought it had, or it does, but we weren't tapping into it properly. So the, the cable that he handed me was supposed to be 500 watts, and it was about 100 watts. And so I plugged into it and blew his fuse. So, so he's got to get an electrician to do some modifications to his airplane, and then we'll be able to fly directly from his power. And in the meantime, we now have the LiDAR operating in my lab upstairs on car batteries. And we can fly for about two hours that way. And so here's our LiDAR system. This is upside down. So this metal frame. Um, fits over his hole in the floor. So these bolt holes are to match his bolt holes on his airplane. So th this is one telescope. This is the second telescope. We have two telescopes, small telescopes, because we have two channels. One is co-polarized, one is cross-polarized. So we get, every time we get a measurement, we get it at two, at two polarizations. The laser is here. So the laser beam comes out, and then the backscattered light comes in, gets collected on those two telescopes. These two detectors send their signals to these little modules. So that was the other thing, is we don't have to have a big card that goes into a full-size computer. So we go into these little modules, which actually didn't make it into the picture, sorry. But they're, in this scale, they're about this big. So they just strap in here. They're actually pulled out right now, because one's getting repaired. That's why it didn't get in the picture. And this little box sits on the floor in the back of the airplane. A laptop drives the whole thing. It's all USB connected. And that's been a real challenge because we're just on the ragged edge of you know, pushing everything as hard as we can to get the data throughput. But it's working. It's just difficult. So here's a close-up picture of the laser with the beam coming out of here and the two receivers. One is larger than the other because there's less light in the cross-polarized channel, so we have a larger aperture to collect more light. But they're very small. They're like two inches and three inches diameter. And that's really a very aggressive, aggressively small compact design. But I think we're going to get away with it. We've done some experiments. I think it's going to work. This is a less neat picture of the LiDAR when it was in the back of Rick's plane. But it's all mounted up, looking down through the hole. Um, here's our electronics with cables everywhere. All those cables now are run neatly. And so we basically only. When we go into this plane next time, we'll have that box, a LiDAR, and two cables. It will be much neater, which will reduce problems. So we never got off the ground when we were flying with him before flying with him because we 
popped the fuse, and we couldn't. We went and bought batteries. We tried to make it work, and we just couldn't get it to work. So we went back to the lab, and I put Mike to work. And he's been working ever since to get it working. And so here's him testing it in the hallway. And so this is the LiDAR sitting sideways, pointing down the hall, making a very bright green spot at the other end of the hall. And we're doing alignment measurements, getting the optics all tweaked up so that we're ready to take measurements. And then we've been testing it looking up at clouds because we know how to do that with LiDARs. And this is what you see. This is altitude and digital number. So your signal is increasing to the right. And then the height above you is increasing here. So if this was a plot of the LiDAR data from the airplane, it would be upside. It would look like this, but we would interpret it. We would plot it upside down so that the surface was up here, and then the signal was going down below that, below the surface of the water. In this case, it's up, and we're seeing background scattering, and then there's a big, huge peak where there's a cloud. And I don't have polarization data to show you because we're just doing that right now. And so, in summary, we've built the system, we've tested it with clouds, we have it working much better than it was working before. We're ready for flight testing again. Um, we're hoping that one of these days we can get up later this spring or early summer with Rick and, and just do some demonstration flights so that we can see what it will see when it looks into the lake. And as always, we're open and interested in hearing collaborative research ideas. So thank you very much. So this is where I open it up for questions, if you have any. We've had a nice discussion as I went along, and I, I like doing it that way. But if we've got any residual questions, please go ahead. With, uh, with three. Can I, please push oh. the mic? Ah, so you've got a mic near you that you can push. Push it and the mic comes on. OK. Push and talk. Uh, with Rick involved, Flathead Biological Station, and then the lake trout in Flathead Lake, is there plans also to do work there as well as Yellowstone Lake? Yes. Yeah, I should have mentioned that. But my focus has been on Yellowstone Lake just because I'm down here. But, but with Rick involved, we're very much interested in learning what, he, what questions he has to ask about Flathead Lake. So yes. Are they cutthroat up there? They're sad. I don't know the details of what fish species are in flathead lake, so I better not answer that question. The question was, are there cutthroat up there? And I, I think the answer is yes, but I, one of you might know. Rick certainly knows. There is a lake. There is a lake trout issue. I know there's, there's a lake trout issue. Oh, sorry, bull trout and cutthroat. Uh, okay. And many others. Go ahead. So I have a question about um, how you either. Oh yeah. Um, how you either ground truth or calibrate the the data for you know fish density, so you get sort of a scattering. But then, how do you link that to either some like fish number or I don't know. So the kind of work that we were doing is just looking for hits, just kind of yes no. We see fish or we don't. So that's easier. It doesn't require calibration. But but Jim at NOAA has done work exactly what you're describing where the question was about how do you relate the signal, how do you calibrate the signal to something like fish density. And in fact, he's done that. And one of the ways he's done that is you have to kind of do it species by species, because obviously it's different. And so he did it with sardines in a tank at Scripps. And so yeah, he just literally put the LIDAR on the side of the Scripps tank, Scripps deep tank, and shot, shot it into the water and, and calibrated that way. So you put a calibration scattering target in the water. You also have the fish. And you have a camera running, and you take images and process them. This, this data shot was taken with this many fish in the beam, that kind of thing. You know, 3.5 fish or whatever. Yeah, I was wondering if you could sort of do repeat flyovers of a fish hatcher. Well, it would be like 12 this time. Yeah, the, you can do that too. You can do airborne calibrations. And, and so we do a lot of, over the years, We've done a lot of flights with um, some kind of ground truth from ships, for example, with nets or acoustics. You know, people have been running acoustics for a lot longer than they've been running LIDARs. So Jim has published a number of papers comparing the LIDAR signatures with acoustic signatures, so acoustic fish finders on the boat, and found that if I tweak my data this way and that way, then I can make it match what the acoustics system is showing. And that way I can 
feedback information that people are used to seeing. And we've never done that up here in the lake, but I think we would have that option because there are acoustics on acoustic sensors mounted on some of those boats at Yellowstone Lake, for example. So there's lots of things we can do like that that we just haven't done yet. So this is great, Joe. I think you've convinced me that uh, uh, terrestrial oh, harvest... Push your button, sorry. Do you have a button near you? I'm trying to be mindful of the folks in remote. So, so I think you've convinced me that uh, in your picture, shooting the water is much trickier than shooting the land behind it. Yeah. So do you have like high schoolers or middle schoolers in your lab who are working on the strap-on terrestrial LIDAR scanning device for these planes of opportunity? Because I'd love some LIDAR for this part of the world. Um, that's an interesting question. So basically make a, make a different... The, the problem with doing that is I can't just modify this system to do the terrestrial. We can use this for terrestrial mapping, but I'd have to attenuate my beam way down. But I could do it. But I would only be getting a, so I could fly with this LiDAR and give you a, a strip chart, basically. I can give you a line profile. Instead of a three-dimensional map, I can give you a two-dimensional profile. So if that's useful for something you're doing, we can do it with this LiDAR. We would attenuate the beam because we're hitting it with too much light. But when, when you start talking about now modifying this to do the more traditional terrain mapping, it really is just starting over, because you have to start with a totally different laser, a totally different receiver. It's a totally different instrument. And so, yeah, the answer is we're very interested in doing that, especially I would like someday to build something using a very small, like a diode laser or something. I don't know if people have done that. You know, you could potentially make a terrain mapping LIDAR that would fly in a very small package. But we haven't built such a game yet, so. By a drone. Or a drone, yeah. UAV or a drone, absolutely. I, and I'm sure there's people out there working toward these types of things. And maybe they've done it already, but I can't point to who's done it yet. If you can see water vapor, then can you do birds? You ought to be able to do ver birds very easily. Sure, sure. The question was, can we see birds? If we're pointing a LiDAR beam into the air, you can see. In fact, a number of years ago, we got pulled aside in a direction that we didn't anticipate going. We spent, you know, eight years figuring out how to measure bees, honeybees. Hmm. Um, Jerry Bromenshank at University of Montana has this idea that he can use honeybees to detect anything with a chemical signature, including buried landmines and explosives. Hmm. So to demonstrate that, he had to have a way of mapping out where the bees were and where they were going. So we actually developed and patented a method of doing that with a custom-designed LiDAR system. And we're, we're still playing with that a little bit, but we don't do, we're not trying to be insect. What's the size of your field when you're doing that? In terms of like the volume that we're sampling? Like these, the, uh, the, the old system only had about a two inch spot that was scanning around. The new system we're trying to build actually has a much larger spot to do a larger sampling area, but it's scannable. So it's kind of interesting. <laughs> And so, yes, birds would be easy. If a bird flew, flew through your beam, you would see it without any difficulty at all.